The following recordings are part of the Daedalus operation, a top secret experiment taking place in <laughs> authorized by <laughs> only authorized members may listen to these files. I woke up in an empty room. My head is pounding and my heart feels like it dropped into my stomach. My eyes take a few moments to adjust to the strange lighting as I look around. Nothing... Nothing really makes sense to me. The room is ordinary, a drab and colorless place that has no markings of any kind on the walls and the four hallways that branch off to directions that look just as bland. There's nothing to indicate where I am or how long I've been there, except maybe the tiredness of my body. I take a moment to examine myself and notice a few wounds, one of which resembles a Roman numeral. Fourteen, to be exact. How I got the tattoo or why there is an ankle monitor on my right leg now escapes my memory. I sit up and I try to recall the circumstances that brought me here, but... But... Nothing is coming back to me. The past is a blur except for pain. I can recall faint voices, but then I second-guess myself. And are those my voice? Are those just my voice getting mixed with the strange acoustics of this place? I finally decide to stand and pop my back, noticing that my clothes resemble a prison uniform, minus any designation to explain where I am. Was this some kind of penitentiary? I decided my best option would be to explore and learn as much as I could, maybe find someone else that could help explain things. Unfortunately, there's nothing to indicate which way I should go, so I mentally tossed a coin and chose to go to the path on my immediate right. The hallway felt endless and eerie. Occasionally, the box lights flickering, and the corridor seemed to flicker in the distance as I kept walking. Eventually, I wound up in another room, mirroring the first. In fact, I wondered if, if it might be the same room or not. Carpet, ceiling, and everything else looked no different. I tried the path on my left this time, arriving at another empty room about twenty minutes later. I sat down to test and looked around, trying to figure out if I was just walking in circles. There were no tools I could use to attempt at mapping a path, unfortunately, but I decided to try something unique. Took off my left shoe, placing it near to the right exit hallway. I mentally counted as I began to walk away, keeping my hand on the wall until I reached the next wide open zone. There was no shoe to be seen, and for a brief moment I felt a flicker of hope, realizing that maybe I could continue on in the same direction and find a way out. I started towards the corridor directly opposite of me, a renewed spirit in my bones as I thought of escaping the maze, but soon an hour passed, then another, going on the straight linear path and I was, I was seemingly no closer to getting out. I took another break and rubbed my sore bare foot wishing that I had never considered walking on this rough texture for so long. Since I was about midway through a corridor, I turned back around, deciding to make camp in the previous open area. As I came back to the zone, I felt my heart skip a beat when I saw something on the ground. It was... It was the same shoe that I had discarded hours ago, yet... Here, right after traveling for so long, in one direction, it had returned. Is this maze some kind of a spatial distortion? The more I've been trapped here, the more I recognize it's not a normal prison. Something beyond my comprehension brought me here, I, I thought as I rested against one of the concrete pillars. It was so quiet. A stillness across the corridors made me feel on edge, despite the fact that I hadn't seen anything else since my arrival here. I closed my eyes and tried to ignore the deafening silence as I listened to my own heartbeat. I have to remain sane and hope that a solution will present itself. Just as I was about to fall asleep, something unexpected happened. A noise, like rain falling from heaven, came from above the bland lightning. I jerked my head up, trying to figure out what it might be, and then a small, black opening slid apart from one of the tiles, revealing an empty tunnel above my head. It looked like a... Like a drop shoot. I stared up at it for a moment, wondering, for the briefest of moments, if there would be any way that I could climb up and follow it to the surface. If there, there even was a surface. 
There's no source of light, no indication that I could even grip onto the signs. Not to mention I had nothing to use to make it to the tunnel that was approximately 10 feet above my head. But then I heard a strange noise from somewhere above. Like the rushing of wind. I saw something amid the shadows and I panicked. It was a person. Before I had time to react, the newcomer fell directly on top of me, knocked the wind out of my lungs, I closed my eyes in pain, their body weight making my entire lower half ache as I tried to find a way to push them off of me. And then I got a good look at the stranger that had been unceremoniously dropped in here with me. The newcomer was a woman, probably a, a little younger than me, wore the same drab jumpsuit with a monitor on her wrist. They were unconscious, but clearly stable. Notice they had a marking on their wrist, much like mine. One numeral higher. Fifteen. I had no idea what any of this meant, but it did at least confirm that someone, or something perhaps, had trapped us here. If we survived long enough, perhaps we could find a way out, I thought, as I sat alongside the stranger and waited for her to wake up. When her eyes did flutter open, I was reminded of my first few moments here. Confusion and worry were covering her face. And then she saw me and began to push herself away, frantically looking around the empty room. What do you want from me? What is this place? She asked. I think she was searching for something to defend herself with, but the prison offered nothing, and I only raised my hands defensively to show her I meant no harm. I'm stuck here, just like you, I said, gesturing to my ankle monitor and showing my tattoo. I made her examine her own clothes and realize I was telling the truth. Where are we then? How, how long have you been here? She asked, looking around the empty corridors. I wish I knew the answer to the first question. Truth is, I've been wandering around here for at least six hours now, and I thought, I thought I would have been here alone forever. Some kind of simulation, I think. Virtual reality? I can't fully explain why I think that, to be honest. None of this feels real. She stood up, rubbing her aching muscles, and extended a hand to me. Sorry for such a rough start, then. I'm Lucia. Seems we're stuck in this mess together. Dexter. But friends call me Dex. I said, glad that I wasn't so alone with my thoughts. Alright then, Dex. So you say that you've been here for six hours... This place is some kind of maze or something? She asked, looking towards the nearest corridor. Always stretch towards more areas like this that are equally bland. Nothing of interest as far as the eye can see. The only thing to even make me reconsider the possibility of a simulation was when I saw you drop from the ceiling. She looked towards the roof, squinting at the lights before commenting. So I was dropped in like a rat in a rat lab maze, huh? So funny. Do you... Do you remember anything about before? Before she could respond, both of us were startled by a sharp noise from our left. It sounded like a mixture between a vacuum cleaner and a bulldozer. It was loud enough to make me temporarily cover my ears. Has that ever happened before? She asked once the sound stopped. No. Maybe we should investigate, I suggested. Together we started down the corridor. I kept a distance from her to give her both a sense of security, and because despite all the similarities to my own arrival here, I wasn't sure I could trust her. I mean, call me paranoid, but this place, this place felt like it could throw tricks at you. So I always made sure that she was in front. At the next empty area, we heard another noise. This time to our left, and Lucia looked at me to see if we were going to follow. I didn't really see any other options at this point, so we did. As we walked, Lucia told me a little about herself. So I was raised by my grandparents in Croatia. They used to keep me every summer, tell me, let me go swimming at night on the beach. Then when my father and mother died in a horrible accident, they adopted me. I was fortunate to have them as guardians until I was of legal age, but if you wondered if I could be some kind of criminal, one to deserve this punishment, the answer is no. How about you, Dex? Kill anyone to be sent to hell? I was surprised by her candidness, 
hated to admit that my life was not so cheery and pleasant. I was, um... I was in the military, second generation. Wanted to make a name for myself, get rid of my family legacy. They weren't the exact stellar examples of society, I told her. So then that might be the reason you're here? Sins of the family? Before I could respond, the noise sounded like it was almost on top of us, and both of us saw something coming down the corridor. At first it looked like a wall of black slime radiating and grabbing at the sides of the hall to pull itself forward. As I got closer, I realized that it was actually made of dark stone, with hundreds if not thousands of skulls and body parts forged into its amalgamation, and it was slowly working its way towards us. That's, um... That's new, I said, my throat feeling dry as I took a step back. Lysia didn't need to be prompted. We ran back to the nearest open area and stayed there, trying to figure out if the strange demon wall was following us. All we heard was the noise. Sometimes strange wails like the souls of the dead trapped within were trying to call to us. I said when the noise became loud again. I was sure the creature would appear in the room that we were hiding, and Lucia nodded before pointing towards the west corridor. We ran down it, listening for the sounds of demonic beasts as we reached what looked like a metallic grating. When we got up to it, I bent down and said, it might be an air vent. It might be our ticket out of here. Or it could be another trap. I don't trust it, she argued. This is the first chance at freedom that I've seen all day. Okay, we have to give it a shot. I insisted as I tried to find a way to pry it open, but without proper tools, I could tell it wasn't going to work. Do you think maybe that monster might be able to destroy this thing? I mean, if we lured it here, I asked. It'd be risky. It could wind up killing us. Lysia said. Would you rather keep wandering the wasteland? Lysia didn't have an answer for this as I sat down next to the air vent, determined to give the plan a shot. It's been ten hours. I need food, water. Damn, do I need to pee. If I could confront that thing and use it to get out of here, then I'll give it a try. Lysia sighed in frustration and sat down alongside me. Give it a few hours. Do you really think that thing will show up? seems to be haunting us. She didn't have any other words for the moment, and silence soon enveloped the hallway. After about a half an hour, I decided to try small talk and speculated. This may not be the work of our government. Well, I'm British, so I'm not sure what you mean, Lysia said as she stretched and laid down on the rough carpet. I, I mean, like, like humans. You know, everything that we've seen, it, it's so advanced. It can't possibly be from Earth, right? Because I need answers, don't you? Don't you want to know? You know, even if there was a way out of this, this hole? She opened her mouth to respond, but the screams of the creature answered me instead. Somehow it was almost on top of us. I scrambled up and Lysia followed behind me, muttering, what exactly is the plan here? The sound of the wall grating against the side of the corridor made my ears hurt, but I wasn't focused on that. Instead, I wanted to see what happened as the massive, angled arms of the monster ripped into the wall. It was tearing into the fabric, destroying it completely. If we can get that thing to slam its claws down here on the vent, we stand a chance of getting it to, to snatch it up, I told her. The thing was so close I could feel it breathing, and I was certain the wall of flesh had a heartbeat. Lucia hesitated for a moment and then, then began to run. Where are you going? I shouted, but she was long gone. I cursed silently to myself as I felt the edge of the wall hit my foot and looked down towards the drooling amalgamation of skin and bone. It could smash me in a single blow. I stood right against the vent and waited for its claws to slam down before moving out of the way, but I wasn't fast enough. The creature slashed against my back and I fell down in pain, feeling the wound open up to the air. Another blow like that and I would be dead, and the wall was about to cover me completely. Then I heard shouting. Lucia, hey you big lug, over here! She shouted. I could see she was waving something to attract the monster's attention, and as it turned, the vent pried open, and I heard the gasp of fresh air below. You have to hurry, I shouted as I saw the vent was trying to close shut again. Go, find a way out of here, and come back for me, she yelled back as she ran down the corridor. The monster crawled its hefty body towards her, just barely giving me room to squeeze by towards the open vent. The hole below my feet was pitch black, but the time for second-guessing myself was over. I jumped down into the abyss. I could feel the rush of air hit me as I slid down the narrow hole. I tried to hold back the urge to yell and wondered how far down I would go before hitting anything. The sensation of free fall was so jarring and after a long moment even the memory of up or down seemed 
impossible to comprehend. There was nothing as far as the eye could see, and yet I still fell. Had I escaped the simulator, and I was now just a glitch in the strange matrix? I closed my eyes and tried to listen for any sound of a solution to this predicament. I could hear faint whispers. It sounded like something from an endless database. Numbers being whispered into the abyss. They were being read off so fast I, could, I couldn't comprehend what they meant. And then before I could even try to memorize any of them, I saw a bright light below my feet. A rush of sensations overpowered my body just as I slipped to the floor. And right before I hit the carpet, I saw an older woman with gray braids and dark skin. And then I blacked out as my body crumpled against the ground. When I woke up, I was in a small room with no lights. I looked out the doorway and I saw the same familiar drab area, except this time the walls were covered in writing. The same numbers that I had heard whispered in that endless fall. They were... They were everywhere. <laughs> what did they mean? I walked out to get a better look, and I saw that the woman was busy using her long fingernails to scratch more numbers into an empty space. A name also constantly appeared amidst the equations. Icarus. I turned around to try and understand more about my new surroundings, but the small room that I had just been resting in seemingly had disappeared. The woman turned to me, her eyes sparkling with questions and hint of madness. Who's that? I asked, pointing to the name that she had inscribed a thousand times. This place, built for it, to be created, she answered. I got closer to her, trying to see if she had a numeral on her arm or a monitor. She had neither. You're not a prisoner? We're all prisoners now, son she told me. So, then you're in charge. Tell me more. Tell me, tell me what we can do to escape. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. We're trapped here forever. It's all for nothing, she said as she went back to scrawling on the walls. I clenched my fist in frustration. L Listen, you old hag, I don't want to die here because of you. She didn't seem to understand why I was angry and pushed me back with more strength than I expected. If you want to see the truth, you find the beginning, she told me. I did my best to draw in my breath and calm down. She was starting to make sense of that. I didn't want to lose this chance to have a conversation. Clearly, she knew more about this place than I, and I needed to find out why. She led me down one of the nearby corridors, and I followed like an obedient and loyal dog. The walls were covered with her scrawling some of which looked like it had been jabbed away at so much that it, I couldn't tell where she began or ended. How long have you been here? Here, there. It really doesn't matter anymore, she responded. I sighed and tried a different approach as we approached a new room. This area was completely fresh, untouched by her mangled nails. You've been working on a mathematical theory of some kind, right? You said it was... To create something important? She nodded as she looked down at the carpet. I did too, instinctively, and noticed a bloody stained ring that was large enough for several grown men. There used to be many of us. Now we... We are few. We are all part of it. All designed to die. And what did you create? Before I could get a straight answer, I heard a powerful roar, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It was larger than anything I could imagine. I, I grabbed the woman to flee, but she planted her feet down and remained as still as a tree. We cannot run. It would be pointless. Your death is benefiting the end game. The zero sum must be met. It's the only solution that could provide salvation. As she finished her words, I heard the strange voices again amidst the walls. Were those the lost souls of others that had died to the mad whims of the experiment? The noise of the monster grew closer. I, I was running out of time. We can't just sit here and die. That, that won't solve anything. There must be another way, I told her. She was frozen. Paralyzed in fear for what has to come. How many times has she seen this play out? Was that why she felt so hopeless? Was, was this why she felt our destruction was inevitable? But still, I wondered, if all those people had died, why had the maze spared her? What secrets did she hold? But I need you to tell me more. I can help you, I pleaded. 
She didn't respond. She didn't even blink. Just as I was about to grab her by the shoulders and shake her like a doll, I felt myself being lifted up into the air. I looked down and saw my body was being nearly crushed by a giant's hand. It was covered in strange brown molding warts and then I turned and I screamed. It had the face of a bull split open with the mouth of a shark. Its body was exposed and revealed a stuffed gullet full of other corpses, all of which were writhing and struggling to break free. And it was drawing me closer to the writhing dagger-like blades that were inside of its splintered mouth. It began to force my body into its grinding teeth as I screamed for help from the woman. She was at least ten feet below me as I felt it snap and break my legs. The pain was excruciating and yet I, I still couldn't pass out. All I could do was beg for this monster to stop. And she was smiling. And then my head got bent and snapped as the crushing jaw of the beast ripped into my neck and darkness covered me. I was inside its throat. My body stretching and contorting into ways that I didn't think were possible. I should have died. That darkness felt like death, but it wasn't. I was somewhere between life and death. The pain, the pain was there for what felt like hours, pain and suffering. It lingered as I found myself meshed with others in a net of sinew and bone. They screamed and clawed at what was left of my battered body. I tried to fight it off, but I felt more like a cog in a machine. A meaningless fear that would obey its master. Finally, the voices returned. This time louder than ever. They were screaming the endless numbers into my ear, and then it was like everything was gone, and I heard the numbers in my head. And all around, they were the only thing that seemed to survive my transition into the afterlife or toward whatever hell was next for me. The numbers were going backward this time. I felt my body being forced back into a single, cohesive form, and it felt like I was flying up. My bones healed, pushed together, my neck snapped back, and then the pain was extracted like poison being sucked out of an open wound. I was nothing, and I felt everything all at once, and then I had a memory of a time before I was here. I couldn't make sense of everything, but I saw faces that felt familiar, like a dream where you know the memories are trying to push together to make a picture, but it still is out of sight. But I saw dozens of people. We were standing near a door, connected to a white space. We were talking and explaining the numbers, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear what we were saying. It felt like we were on the cusp of discovery, and then chaos came and ripped us to shreds. The people melted into the floor. And I was sucked into the white nothing. Could that have been what happened right before my arrival here? How... How long ago was that? Suddenly I was in an open room again, much like the first one. And as I looked down at my legs, I saw that the monitor on my ankle was active still. But the number on my arm had changed. Now it read... 16. Had I died that many times, my memories being stripped away piece by piece as I was destroyed and forced to live and survive. Inside of my left, there was a backpack now. and Inside, there were small tools, including a knife. I considered plunging it into my chest to end this agony, but I feared I'd be resurrected again with less to work with, so instead I used it to work on my ankle monitor. I wondered how it had gotten there or if it had been there all along. The maze seemed to be alive, taunting me to keep pushing forward in my efforts to learn. Knowledge felt meaningless, though. Only survival mattered. The other tools felt useless in the maze, but I decided to go through them anyway. I saw sketch pads and journals, small bits of food. Though I realized, despite how much time had passed, I'd... I had never felt hunger. Maybe I'd been dead all along. Purgatory. Certainly could have been hell, I thought as I worked at the ankle monitor with a knife. It's almost completely off. My skin is bloody and I'm dizzy from the experience. I felt so faint and I think I should have moved on as soon as the monitor was gone. Move and find a place to hide before any new monsters are born. I'll leave the weapon here in case any unfortunate soul drops into this cage. 
I hope that I don't bleed out in the maze as I wander blindly. Hope for escape is all that I have left to cling to. But I may slip away soon. I may slip away as well. Goodbye, hopefully. Not forever. End recording. File under Daedalus Test, subject number 14 and 16. Continue the process of creating new mutation. Better plans for next mission by end of month. Mission statement adjustment to expand parameters of dimensional gateways to explore further details of the new dimension and determine the flow of time within and to make contact with life forms within. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or by listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, or by finding this in some other way that's not a podcast or a video, which I probably didn't upload, but hey, thank you for listening. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting for me to update my Patreon, and I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Justin LaFontaine, Broken Beast 320, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Adam Grecky, Love You MNN, M, Insanity Gamers X, Jordan Humble, Jesus Kef, Jesus Coneo, Yargul, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Mill Crow, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Athamarius, Grand Moth the Milky, Captain Scurvy, Estebean, Braden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sect Time, Angelus, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Carolinian, Zachary Graphius, Lord Life's Vest, Goreg Trim Megacy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Fikamel, Leader Count, Melton Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sasaku, Crokinut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Hater Chip, Acid System, Cryptic Nightmares, Here the Sloth, Fester Lampshade, Nico Kayo, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Corey Kenshin, Mr. Diamond One, and Peaceful Buddha. If you would like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, or you can honestly support for even just $1, because it really helps me out when you guys do, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon, thank you all so, so much. Thank you for watching on YouTube, and subscribing, and liking videos, and leaving comments about videos that you like, or leaving comments about why I haven't finished the fourth audiobook yet, or leaving comments about... <laughs> New stories that you've seen and you'd like to see on this channel. And to everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>